Welcome to Progenesis Academy. For those who are not familiar with our program, we are a non-profit, non-biased program dedicated to patient education. We also do education for embryologists and reproductive endocrinologists. And for those who have not had a chance to claim a certificate of attendance, we do uh, provide uh, that for those who wanted to get some CUs uh, for, for, for credit uh, purpose. You can see all our webinars on our website, but you can also see them on Progenesis Academy YouTube channel. Today's topic is managing mosaicism, recommendation, and transfer decision. We brought two excellent physicians, introducing Dr. Rohi Jalani. She is a reproductive endocrinologist and co-director at Fertility Preservation and Ovarian Asian Center for Excellence at Vios Fertility Center. And we have Dr. Sharara. He is the founder and medical director at Virginia Center for Reproductive Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Perfect. Thank Excellent. you for that. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Well, I am really excited about this topic today because, you know, it's about mosaicism and this is a story that keep evolving over time and new data, new perspective come in. So today we, I'm going to start the conversation because we have a mix of embryologists and, um, and, and patients. I'm going to ask you guys to define mosaicism the way you define it for patients. And I'll start with you, Dr. Jelani. How do you define mosaicism? Yeah, I tell patients it's very simple. So I use an example, like a mosaic, like a window that you may look at. And it's a cluster of different array of cells. And some cluster of those cells that we biopsy may look normal and some cluster looks abnormal. And it's not enough to give a definite answer. So we see an array. And then the level of mosaicism is how many we see of each to define that, um, to help kind of break it down, what that means. Thank you so much. Dr. Sharara? Yeah, I tell them uh, that when we take few cells of the trophoectoderm, let's say we remove about five or six cells, mosaicism means that we have a mixture of normal cells and abnormal cells. And the degree of mosaicism, uh, if we're dealing with a low mosaic, mosaic embryo, it means most of the cells are actually normal and there are about maybe 20 to 40 percent that are maybe up to 50 percent that are uh, that are abnormal. Uh, a high mosaic is when you have, you know, more abnormal cells than normal cells. Uh, and a euploid embryo is one where all the cells are perfectly normal. So it's a, it's just before we used to have mosaics and uh, and aneuploid and euploids. Now we have low and high mosaics, which actually makes the um, uh, makes the discussion even easier for the patients to understand. Yeah. And so the two of you have been practicing for a long time. Um, you, Dr. Shara, have been practicing for years. How mosaicism have been, uh, you know, uh, of an issue to, in, in the years that you have been practicing? Have you identify any possible mosaicism in, in pregnancy or in deliveries or... In, I, in, in I personally life. have never seen one. Uh, I mean, these are uh, the incidence of actual true mosaicism is very, very low, less than 2%. Most of them are confined placental mosaicism. Um, I've never had a patient call me and tell me, oh, you know, my child was diagnosed with mosaicism. So we know that the incidence of true mosaicism is much, much less than the one that's diagnosed when uh, you get reports back. And luckily, you know, at progenesis, we don't see that many mosaic embryos. But in other, uh, for other labs, uh, you know, that we used earlier, the incidence of mosaicism could be as high as about, you know, 10, 15 percent. And if you read, you know, Santi's paper on a thousand mosaic embryos, uh, the variation was anywhere between 10 up to 20, 22, 23 percent mosaics. Um, so that depends on obviously the algorithm that you use on the platform that we use but the higher the instance of mosaicism the more problematic it is for us to discuss with patients so if it's something that doesn't occur frequently like five six percent it's one thing versus when you discuss when you see 25 percent mosaicism you know that cannot be real 
So the incidence of mosaicism by trophoectodon biopsies, when we're only looking at about five or six cells is one thing versus at delivery when you're dealing with a huge number of cells, then obviously the, the incidence is not as high as uh, we get when we get reports back on PGTAs. Thank you so much. Dr. Jelani, can you tell us about your experience on, on a yeah. clinical, clinical perspective? Yeah, I actually have a paper published in 2014, 2015, but very similar, like Dr. Sharara was saying, it's, it was confined placental mosaicism. And we followed the pregnancy all the way from conception till delivery and um, onward to see if it was truly, because we couldn't decipher through MFM, through amnio, whether it was truly confined um, uh, placental mosaicism. So it was a very interesting case report, but like Dr. Sharara was saying, it's very, very rare. And it kind of brings us back to the question, what is truly mosaicism and where do we stand on that? And remember, we were transferring embryos before we started doing PGTAs. We were transferring embryos not knowing what they were. Uh, and, you know, I don't think many of us have seen children with uh, with mosaicism at the point at, at this, you know, when we were doing this. Uh, so we know this is not um, a, a common incidence uh, that we're dealing with. But again, uh, the higher the mosaic percentage of embryos that we get, the more confusing it is for the patient. Absolutely. And, and uh, in natural conception, what mosaic, is mosaicism a thing? Less than 1%, I think, if I'm not mistaken. In the general population. Right. Because I don't hear mosaicism, uh, you know, talk in OBGYN world, mm -hmm. right? We don't right. hear that much about mosaicism. What, what do you think, in your opinion, Dr. Sharara, what do you think the factors that drive uh, these mosaic, mosaic calls. You, you hint on the technology. What is, in your opinion, that? that the well, I, I think it has to do with the fact that you're making a call based on a very small number of cells. Uh, I mean, you've dealt with one cells before, one cell before, and now you're doing, you're making a report based on about five or six cells when you do an uh, a, a trophoctodon biopsy. Uh, so, and that depends on the platform, the depth of the platform, which one you're using, your algorithm. Uh, so, and what you call mosaic. Uh, I mean, there are some, uh, some genetics lab that basically would call anything above, above 20% as mosaic. Um, and um, so that's why we had in the early days, um, a much higher incidence of mosaicism. And we did not, now that we're getting low and high mosaics, uh, we're seeing that actually low mosaics is as close to being euploid as possible. It's slightly lower chance of a pregnancy, a slightly higher chance of a miscarriage. But it, in, in my book, I tell somebody with a low mosaic, this is as close as being euploid as possible. The sad part is some of, some of the patients are so afraid of transferring anything with mosaicism, uh, and they, some of them may discard these embryos, unfortunately. The good news is that genetic counselors now are actually counseling these patients that have low, low mosaics to go ahead and proceed with, with a transfer. In the early days, they would tell them, oh, it's mosaics, we don't recommend you transfer. So there has been a shift uh, in attitude um, about transferring mosaic embryos. There's still some programs that would tell you, you know, Nabil, like, if it's mosaic, just call it aneuploid. We don't want to even deal with it. I know of a very large program in my part of the uh, of the country that refuse to transfer mosaic embryos because they don't want to deal with potential maybe lawsuits down down the road. So it, every program has to make their own call about what to do with mosaic embryos. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Jelani, what is your experience uh, as far as patients' opinion about transferring mosaic embryos? Do, do, have you seen cases where a patient either went one way or another? And how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, very similar to what Dr. Sharara does. I think a lot of a lot of IVF is based on patient expectations and education. So educating them that, like we were talking about earlier, that this is a spectrum. What mosaicism is, is a reflection of a very few amount of cells of the embryo. And a low level mosaic, like Dr. Sharar said, is as close to as you played as possible. So with appropriate genetic counseling, 
I have transferred mosaic embryos and have gotten healthy live birds that are not reflective of the PGT. Um, so I always tell them that it's like a coin toss uh, that with appropriate counseling and guidance that we do allow them to transfer mosaic embryos and we do report mosaicism. And I think as a patient, just knowing that you have that choice and knowing that you get, you know, embryos are very hard to come about um, and kind of having some embryos as a backup. So it's not the first one that I would go for, but if that's our last resort, then with proper counseling, that's what we do. Awesome. Awesome. And if you have a patient that does not want to transfer a mosaic result that you feel they have pretty good chance of getting pregnant, like what that decision look like in your hand, Dr. Sharada or, 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 or Dr. Jelani, either way. Well, Dr. Dr. Sharada, I was going to say, I think um, as being a patient as well, I think patient autonomy is huge. So if you're not comfortable with transferring a mosaic, then that's your choice. Then we don't transfer. There's always opportunities and ways to make more embryos. And we talk about that, that route. I think that's huge. And I think that's very important as a doctor to allow those patients that privilege and that choice. Yeah, I mean, if, if they can afford doing another cycle, they don't want to transfer a mosaic embryo, obviously we recommend they do that. The sad part is if they can't and they decide to discard that embryo rather than move ahead and do a transfer. And I mean, it, it's a very emotional uh uh, issue for me when I sit, sit them down and I actually beg them to not throw this embryo because this is, in my opinion, as close to being a normal a euploid embryo as possible. Uh, so that these are the hardest thing for us to deal with when a patient decides to discard uh, such an embryo and, and call it quits and not have children. And are all mosaic type equal? Uh, whether if it's a trisomy 18, 21, or 13, or how, do, like, what does the distinction uh, play uh, when it comes to making that kind of decisions? So, so there, there are obviously uh, uh, mosaics, or depending on if it's whole chromosomes, it's segmental, it's uh, it's one one chromosome, two chromosomes, and specifically which chromosomes. Uh, so we try to avoid obviously 13 and uh, and 18 and 21. Um, and we, uh, you know, prioritize the ones like, you know, the big chromosomes, two, three, four, you know, seven, nine, ten, uh, you know, these these chromosomes. And we try to avoid the two, seven and 16, I think, because they're associated with unipaternal paternal disomy. So we so there, there is, you know, um, and this was published, I think, updated in 2019 as far as which embryos to really prioritize, prioritize for uh, the transfer. Excellent. Dr. Jelani? I actually used to do exactly what Dr. Sharara was doing, showing embryos that have been associated with live births with chromosomal abnormalities, not favor transferring. Those are say, those are the mosaics that we wouldn't consider transferring. But I actually went to a very interesting lecture that debated, it was a debate and said, well, if you're saying mosaicism, um, these are euploid, then you shouldn't be worried about what association that they have with it, you should still consider it a euploid independent of whether it's 18, 13, 21, um, that you're considering them euploid. So you should transfer them that these are, you know, so I think that becomes a very hot topic because those do lead to a life birth. Once again, with appropriate counseling, and we do talk to them about having a possible amniocentesis MFM combo, um, then that's, you know, I think that's once again goes back to autonomy. But yeah, definitely at least on the differential because they do have an associated life birth and syndrome after. Excellent. So your approach is basically lets the patient make the decision. You give them all the education and information and let them make